Muy buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a la Cátedra Abierta en homenaje a Roberto Bolaño. Hoy día tenemos eh, una invitada especial. Tenemos desde Estados Unidos, desde el estado de Connecticut, tenemos a Susan Howe. Ella es eh, autora de una veintena de libros de poesía, pero eh, en Chile está disponible en dos traducciones locales. Una de ellas es eh, el libro de poemas Silencio Pitagórico, publicado por la editorial Overol, y eh, otro libro que está en traducción local es el, el libro Mi Emily Dickinson, publicado esta misma semana por editorial Bisturí 10. Hoy día eh, nuestra invitada va a ser presentada por eh, también un autor local, que, a quien le tenemos mucho aprecio, especialmente porque hoy día está en doble calidad, eh, por un lado como autor para poder presentarla, y también él es el responsable de la traducción de sus poemas. Enrique Winter es poeta, es narrador, es traductor, estudió Derecho, es abogado y magíster en Escritura Creativa por la Universidad de Nueva York, fundó y actualmente coordina el Diplomado en Escritura Creativa de la Pontificia Universidad Católica de Valparaíso, ha publicado eh, una serie de libros en, en poesía, como por ejemplo Atar las Naves, del 2003, Rascacielos, 2008, Guía de Despacho, Lengua de Seña, y la gentrificación del cielo, en la que compila lo mejor de su obra poética, eso fue publicado en el año 2018. Esta, es también autor eh, del disco Agua en Polvo, y de la novela Las Bolsas de Basura, y ha sido traductor de Dickinson, y también de, sabemos, de Susan Howe, de Chesterton, de Larkin, y Charles Bernstein. Dejo con ustedes entonces a Enrique Winter. Muchas gracias, Rodrigo, por esa presentación, por hacer esto posible. También a Daniel López, que nos ha asistido. Y, por supuesto, una tremenda alegría para mí conocer finalmente a Susan Howe, eh, luego de todos estos procesos de traducción tanto de ella como de Emily Dickinson. Eh, procedo a presentarla y luego ustedes escucharán las ponencias de ella sobre el desde el libro Mi Emily Dickinson y también un par de poemas de Silencio Pitagórico. Susan Howe fue pintora y luego actriz, facetas que desarrolla en más de 20 libros de poemas sonoros y archivos históricos, usando igualmente palabras sueltas y verso libre, como frases tarjadas, espejeadas, invertidas o recortadas en collage de fotos. Podemos contemplar sus poemas como un cuadro, por la disposición en la página, o un monólogo teatral, por sus titubeantes argumentos. También dejarnos llevar por la música de sus sílabas, repitiendo sonidos que más se parecen entre sí a medida que se alejan de lo representado. A la poesía que ella ensancha y de la cual se fuga, gracias a estas y otras perspectivas, llegó tarde y por accidente, como le gusta aclarar. Ya era autora de siete libros, sin embargo, cuando en 1982, a los 45 años, publicó Pythagorean Silence, traducido recientemente en Chile como Silencio Pitagórico por edición de Overol. La hablante del primero de ellos, Hinge Picture, del año 74, viene desde la prehistoria integrando mitos y la del conjunto de Liberties, del 80, reduce al escritor Jonathan Swift a una especie de espectro de su propia musa, Esther Johnson. La historia y los roles de género, entendidos como fuentes de mentiras y de opresión, son motivos recurrentes en el resto de su obra, como ella expresa con la claridad de un programa político. Escribo para fugarme del consentimiento perfecto y primitivo. Quisiera levantar tiernamente del lado oscuro de la historia las voces anónimas y despreciadas, inarticuladas. Aunque también viene a hablar por las bocas muertas de hilanderas y solteronas, se aleja del objetivo nerudiano porque no busca canalizarlas en su propia voz, sino exponerlas por sí mismas en la imposible unión de los restos. Los testimonios de las víctimas develan así los engaños de las palabras sin necesidad de intervenirlas con juicios condescendientes. En la ficción de las memorias que construyen la historia, 
Las protagonistas pasan a ser las palabras y la trama son los flujos inconscientes en los cuales Howe se baña una y otra vez. Su poesía se sirve de la sustracción, porque al borrar los conectores y la posible continuidad de sus ideas, amplía lo que cada lector entiende según sus propias experiencias y conocimientos. Es como si sus poemas hubieran recibido bombas aéreas y leyéramos solo las esquirlas entre los espacios vacíos. Esta fragmentación inunda también sus relatos y ensayos, algunos de ellos ineludibles, como Maya Emily Dickinson, de 1985, que junto con su prefacio para The Gorgeous Nothings, del 2012, cambió para siempre la lectura crítica de la fundadora de la poesía estadounidense. Hoy celebramos la publicación de Emily Dickinson en Chile, traducido por Ana Rosa González Matute y editado por Bisturí 10, que, con razón, en su página web lo anuncia como uno de los ensayos más bellos y complejos que una poeta le haya dedicado al trabajo de otra poeta. Detengámonos un poco en el objeto de estudio entonces, la poesía de Emily Dickinson. Inédita en vida, salvo por 12 poemas reproducidos de forma anónima y probablemente sin su autorización, quebró moldes que le valieron ser considerada por quienes los defendían como una colegiala algo idiota, intelectualmente ciega, parcialmente sorda y más que nada muda al arte de la poesía hasta bien entrado el siglo XX. Habrá sido por el miedo a reacciones similares sumadas a nuestros propios conservadurismos que el traslado de su obra al castellano dure, descartó durante el último siglo el que es quizás el mayor aporte de Emily Dickinson a la poesía universal, la tensión entre la aparente cancioncilla y la densidad de pensamiento, entre lo que oculta y lo que revela. Se ofreció su poesía como la de una mujer romántica y encerrada, loca y dolorosa, blanqueada en un verso que remitía menos al original de lo que lo explicaba. Y en tiempos de pandemia, es la faceta de su encierro la que la hace recobrar importancia mediática, lamentablemente. Quienes la hemos traducido en los últimos 30 años, nos hemos sujetado por el contrario a la poética que relevan los ensayos de Susan Howe, anclados en su contexto intelectual, privilegio asignado casi exclusivamente a los hombres. De más está decir que ellos mismos, habían decidido los límites gramaticales con los cuales Emily Dickinson rompió gracias a un zumbido que es molesto para quien no se adentra en él e hipnótico, hasta gozoso, para quien sí lo hace en poemas y cartas autoconscientes, abundantes en referencias literarias y una búsqueda de verdades donde se mezcla la intuición poética con la observación de campo y diversas ramas de la filosofía, la geología y la biología, por nombrar algunas. Acierta Howe al hablar de su Emily Dickinson, porque son pocos autores, no sucede a tal grado que cada uno tenga el suyo, por más que la decimonónica se escabulla en su ya clásico, soy nadie, ¿quién eres tú? Dickinson altera la apariencia de las cosas y construye el artificio del poema contemporáneo. Declara que la naturaleza es una casa embrujada, pero el arte una casa que intenta ser embrujada. Su poesía abandona cierta transparencia inicial en la cual representaba la realidad, como los demás escritores y escritoras del periodo, hacia otra que va acumulando materiales en tensión, como sucede con las frases subordinadas en la prosa o las divagaciones en el habla, generando polisemias y una comunicación supuestamente trunca que es la que le da sentido al diálogo. Una palabra está muerta cuando se la pronuncia, dicen algunos. Yo digo que a vivir recién empieza ese día. Esta clase de comunicación, a través de la eliminación de las palabras en vez de producirlas, y de los anacolutos o en consecuencias de la construcción del discurso, hayan en la poesía de la misma Howe, un siglo después, resultados contrarios a los de las poetas experimentales de su propia generación. Donde los demás demuestran los sonidos y dobleces de las palabras por vía de usarlas exhaustivamente, ella opta por esconderlas. También se diferencia de los así llamados poetas del lenguaje por anclar sus voces en el pasado, como muestran con elocuencia los fragmentos del ensayo que nos compartirá hoy. En versiones de Verónica Sondek y Rodrigo Lavarría, los co de Dickinson en Chile, Bisturí 10 y Alquimia 
publicaron recientemente la igualmente innovadora Gertrude Stein, cuya vida está en las antípodas de la de Dickinson, de acuerdo a Susan Howe, y es allí donde empieza finalmente este libro, que más que un ensayo, viene siendo momento de describirlo como lo que es. Un tejido de citas que convocan distintas aristas de aproximación a la escritura de Dickinson. Influencias literarias, biografía, poemas, cartas, contexto histórico y el frágil contacto entre el exterior y la intimidad. Las editoras Julieta Marchand y Emiliana Pereira, a quienes agradezco la iniciativa de tenerme aquí, agregan que este volumen está pensando también cómo ensayar lecturas, qué cruces son posibles para leer la singularidad de la obra de una mujer que rebasa su tiempo en los lugares desde los cuales ha leído lo femenino. La clave está en ese cómo, en la manera en que la poeta argumenta merodeando con afecto y suspicacia el objeto de estudio sin reducirlo a categorías, más bien mostrando lo que parecía oculto en un ejercicio parecido al de escribir poemas. No rehuye por eso la lectura académica, ni menos sus limitaciones. Donde Lean Sisu propone un plan para aquello que la escritura de mujeres hará, a Howe le preocupa que se convierta rápidamente en lo que deba hacer. Algo de extrema actualidad en el debate sostenido durante agosto y septiembre, en palabra pública y el desconcierto dentro del mundillo literario chileno. Todo plan y contexto delimitan, y desde ellos, Howe entra de una vez en materia al relacionar los versos de Dickinson, no con su estado marital o anímico, sino con la tradición literaria. Las conexiones entre identidad y memoria, y el desarrollo de la conciencia intelectual de la autora estudiada, fluyen con espontaneidad gozosa hacia la segunda parte del libro, en que presenta un análisis del poema 754, aquel que empieza con My life had stood a loaded gun, o Mi vida era un fusil cargado. Howe llama arqueología a su esclarecimiento de las referencias rumbo a la arquitectura del sentido que bosqueja desde un poema de Browning y varios momentos de Shakespeare, Bronte y Keats, entre otros. El poema individual pasa a formar parte del poema colectivo de la lengua y el ensayo un siglo después también desafiando incluso la manera en que creemos entender lo que leemos. Cierro entonces este breve abrebocas, porque como ustedes vine a escuchar a Susan Howe, y lo hago con sus poemas. Ella opta a veces por difuminar sus unidades, confundiendo los finales de unos con los comienzos de otros, como si se trataran de días y noches en la misma batalla. Nada termina de decirse allí donde el carácter de conversadora define lo femenino, y van mayúsculas tras la mordaza. Ante la muerte de un hijo, por ejemplo, y este ejemplo es bíblico, el llanto de la madre silencia vocabularios completos de nombres para las cosas. Aunque escalofriantes, son pocas las imágenes, y en su mayoría las repite en la naturaleza. Hablábamos un minuto antes de esta presentación de cómo se adelantaba toda nuestra preocupación ecológica, que en ese entonces no fue consciente sino que el poema de algún modo habló por ella, alzando nuevos arquetipos que cambian de sentido cada vez que los usa. Denuncia así la ambigüedad de conceptos que creíamos claros y nos hace dudar de nuestras certezas hasta parecernos peligrosamente autoritarias. En otras ocasiones, el dolor quiebra la sintaxis, pero no sus palabras de amor, sueños y luz, como si solo pudiera sobrevivirnos el lugar común del sentimiento y urgiera recuperarlo con nuevas sutilezas e ironías frente a quienes nos lo robaron. Howe muestra las falencias lógicas que cometemos según cómo ordenamos las palabras y la manera en que éstas sirven a determinadas hegemonías. Redondea las frases como piedras en el agua que las empuja y cada poema puede ser una poética, veladas alegorías profundamente veladas, dice, con mayúsculas a su arbitrio, como las de Dickinson. Al cabo, ambas autoras atentan contra la linealidad de la lectura que reduce la percepción del mundo, cuya perspectiva histórica, tan visitada por Howe, en cambio, permite entender mejor la explotación y las constricciones del presente. Nuestras costumbres y nuestra identidad 
son consecuencia de la función normalizadora de quienes las predican y algo más inocentes de quienes las practican. Howe solo les quita el velo, y es mucho, con palabras desacopladas y deseos vitales, o les pone otro velo, metafísico y fantasmal. Por último, sus poemas, y es el caso también del ensayo sobre Dickinson, decantan en bloques de palabras sueltas, desarmando la legibilidad que pudimos percibir en un comienzo. Se trata de un viaje en el cual las palabras son las únicas pistas que tenemos, dice ella, y nos pueden fallar, como a los inmigrantes. Cada una de ellas lleva el germen de polisemias como las nombradas para Dickinson y que Howe cultiva con aliteraciones y asociaciones libres. Viene a liberarnos del estrés del sentido, operando sobre todo en las demás dimensiones materiales de la palabra, las que parecieran no comunicar tan claramente las de la poesía a lo largo de los siglos. Son esas dimensiones las que descubre en Dickinson y las trae tan al frente que ya no podemos esquivarlas. Bienvenida, Susan Howe. No, eh, eh, muchas gracias, Enrique. Eh, Susan, eh, Enrique has done a wonderful introduction to you, and I think that um, you more than deserve it, and uh, people are waiting uh, for your reading now. Ahora le voy a dar la palabra a Susan para que eh, comience eh, su lectura. So, Susan, you just go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm reading from um, from my Emily Dickinson first, and it's very it's very hard to read it because it's a collage. So many things move into each other. So I've just had to jump around. <laughs> Emerson said the American scholar must be an inventor to read well. He that would bring home the wealth of the Indies must carry out the wealth of the Indies. Emily Dickinson, across the ocean from George Eliot and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, was isolated, inventing, she and American. Isolation in 19th century England and America was spelled the same way, but there the resemblance stopped. Poe, Melville, and Dickinson all knew the falseness of comparing. Stevens and Olson later, the boundless westwardness of everything, ancestral theme of children flung out into memory unknown. Four trees upon a solitary acre without design or order or apparent action maintain. The sun upon a morning meets them, the wind, no nearer neighbor have they but God. The acre gives them place. They him attention of passerby, of shadow, or of squirrel, haply, or boy. What deed is theirs unto the general nature? What plan they severally retard or further unknown? Emily Dickinson took the scraps from the separate higher female education many bright women of her time were increasingly resenting, combined them with voracious and unladylike outside reading and used the combination. She built a new poetic form from her fractured sense of being eternally on intellectual borders where confident masculine voices buzzed an alluring and inaccessible discourse backward through history into aboriginal anagogy. Pulling pieces of geometry, geology, alchemy, philosophy, politics, biography, biology, mythology, and philology from alien territory, a sheltered woman audaciously invented a new grammar grounded in humility and hesitation. Hesitate from the Latin meaning to stick, stammer, to hold back in doubt, 
have difficulty speaking. He may pause, but he must not hesitate. That's Ruskin. Hesitation circled back and surrounded everyone in that confident age of aggressive industrial expansion and brutal empire building. Hesitation and separation. The Civil War had split America in two. He might pause. She hesitated. Sexual, racial, and geographical separation are at the heart of definition. Tragic and eternal dichotomy. If we concern ourselves with the deepest reality, is this world of the imagination the same for men and women? What voice when we hesitate and are silent is moving to meet us? The spirit is the conscious ear. We actually hear. When we inspect, that's audible. That is admitted here. And in English, the pun on here, H-E-A-R and H-E-R-E. For other services as sound, there hangs a smaller ear outside the castle that contain the other only here. At the center of indifference, I feel my own freedom, the liberty and wavering, compression of possibility tensing to spring. Might and might, mystic illumination of analogies, instinctive human supposition that any word may mean its opposite, occult tendency of opposites to attract and merge. Hesitation of us all, one fire, baptized soul, was singing. In many and reportless places, we feel a joy, reportless, but also sincere as nature or deity. It comes without a consternation, dissolves the same, but leaves a sumptuous destitution without a name. Profane it by a search we cannot. It has no home, nor we who having once inhaled it, thereafter roam. On this heath wrecked from Genesis, nerve endings quicken. Na naked sensibility at the extremist periphery. Narrative expansion in contracting, dissolving nearer to know less before afterward schism in some. No hierarchy, no notion of polarity. Perception of an object means loosing and losing it. Quests end in failure, no victory and sham quester. One answer undoes another and fiction is real. Trust absence, allegory, mystery. The setting, not the rising sun, is beauty. No titles or numbers for the poems. That would force order. No titles for the packets she sewed the poems into. No manufactured print, no outside editor, robber. Conventional punctuation was abolished, not to add soigne stitchery, but to subtract arbitrary authority. Dashes drew liberty of interruption inside the structure of each poem. Hush of hesitation for breath and for breathing. Empirical domain of revolution and revaluation, where words are in danger, dissolving. Only mutability certain. I saw no way the heavens were stitched. I felt the columns close. The earth reversed her hemispheres. I touched the universe. And back it slid, and I alone, a speck upon a ball, went out upon circumference beyond the dip of bell. The martyr poets did not tell, but wrought their pang in syllable 
that when their mortal name be numb, their mortal fate encourage some. The martyr po painters never spoke, bequeathing rather to their work, that when their conscious fingers cease, some seek in art the art of peace. In some sense, the subject of any poem is the author's state of mind at the time it was written. But facts of an artist's life will never explain that particular artist's truth. Poems and poets of the first rank remain mysterious. Emily Dickinson's life was language and a lexicon her landscape. The vital distinction between concealment and revelation is the essence of her work. And this is from Blake's Jerusalem. For a tear is an intellectual thing, and a sigh is the sword of an angel king, and the bitter groan of a martyr's woe is an arrow from the Almighty's bow. Her intellectual conscience must never be underestimated. A tear is an intellectual thing. Dickinson ignored the worst advice from friends who misunderstood the intensity of her drive to simplicity, and he did the best, culled from her own reading. Her talent was synthetic. She used other writers, grasped straws from the bewildering raveling of being, wherever and whenever she could use them. Crucial was her ability to spin straw into gold. Her natural capacity for assimilation was fertilized by solitude. The omnivorous gatherer was equally able to reject, to find affirmation in renunciation, and to be herself without outside authority eccentric and unique. Jay Lida tells us that she marked this passage in her family's eight volume edition of the comedies, histories, tragedies, and poems of William Shakespeare, Othello III. He that is robbed, not wanting what is stolen, let him not know it, and he's not robbed at all. Forcing, abbreviating, pushing, padding, subtracting, riddling, interrogating, rewriting. She pulled text from text. And then uh, this is the central poem in the book. Um, ninth poem in Fasco 34. My life had stood a loaded gun in corners till a day the owner passed, identified, and carried me away. And now we roam in sovereign woods, and now we hunt the doe, and every time I speak for him, the mountains straight reply. And do I smile such cordial light upon the valley glow? It is as a Vesuvian face had let its pleasure through. And when at night, our good day done, I guard my master's head. Tis better than the eider duck's deep pillow to have shared. To foe of his, I'm deadly foe. None stir the second time on whom I lay a yellow eye or an emphatic thumb. Though I than he may longer live, he longer must than I. For I have but the power to kill without the power to die. The poem has no title. Thomas H. Johnson dates it about 1863 on the basis of her handwriting. <clears throat> uh, in Ralph Franklin's recent facsimile edition of the 40 fascicles, as Dickinson arranged and bound them, this from the 34th occurs ninth in a series of 18. The fact that my life had stood a loaded gun is placed dead center, may be chance or choice. It consists of six four-line stanzas loosely rhymed. 
written in the plain style of Puritan literary tradition. There are no complications of phrasing. Each word is deceptively simple, deceptively easy to define. But definition, seeing rather than perceiving, hearing and not understanding, is only the shadow of meaning. Like all poems on the trace of the holy, this one remains outside the protection of specific solution. My life had stood a loaded gun, written in a time of civil war, by a woman with little formal education in philosophy, carefully delineates and declines all aspects of the will to power nearly 20 years before Friedrich Nietzsche's metaphysical rebellion. Emily Dickinson's intellectual vigilance allowed very little to escape her without notice. <clears throat> My life had stood a loaded gun. Um, <clears throat> was uh, written um, about 11 years uh, after, oh, I left something out, sorry. Um, when, when Emily Dickinson wrote My Life Had Stood a Loaded Gun, she was in her early 30s, unmarried, virtually housebound um, by what was probably a case of agoraphobia, living with her parents and one unmarried sister in the college town of Amherst. She had been writing hundreds of poems at white heat in total obscurity. The Civil War was in progress. She had recently made her first move toward an outside reading public by sending a letter including some of her poems to the writer and abolitionist Thomas Wentworth Higginson. She must have been wrestling with the knowledge of her extraordinary ability and the contradiction between visionary illumination, grace, and simple human longing for worldly recognition. I took my power in my hand and went against the world. It was not so much as David had, but I was twice as bold. I aimed my pebble, but myself was all the one that fell. Was it Goliath was too large or was myself? too small, and the variant uh, list there was just myself, only me, I. And then we leap ahead. Before he was executed for leading the attack on Harper's Ferry, John Brown handed a last note to one of his jailers. <clears throat> Charleston, Virginia, December 2nd, 1859. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away, but with blood. I had, as I now think vainly, flattered myself that without very much bloodshed, it might be done. At 11 that morning, Brown was escorted from prison and put into the wagon that was to carry him to the scaffold. A crowd gathered in the sunlight to watch a human killing. He saw 2,000 soldiers, cavalry, and cannon. He looked beyond the crowd to the distant Blue Ridge Mountains. This is a beautiful country, he said. I have not cast my eyes over it before. That is, in this direction. Emily Dickinson, who was so often accused of avoiding political issues in her work, certainly did not avoid them here. As she well knew, the original American conflict between idealism and extreme, extremism was being acted out again. John Brown was another Puritan zealot invoking Jehovah, set out to fight the Lord's battle, the Bible's way. Liberators and the righteous were, as always, burning, looting, and destroying. Look not to legislators and churches for your guidance, nor to any soulless incorporated bodies, but to inspirited or inspired ones. That's Thoreau had written in the last days of John Brown. This civil war 
broke something loose in her own divided nature. Now, like Jonathan Edwards, her intellectual forebear, Dickinson explored the links between service and servitude without the locks of custom. Power is a vital necessity for the powerful. They must protect each other at all cost and against all foes. The master makes his worker fear him because of his own fear. The family and woman's position in it, slavery, fate of the eider, are the image of a wide world order. <clears throat> Power of the state corrupts us all, Cold War. A gun is inert matter. Weapons don't fire themselves. Mary Rowlandson's 10-year-old daughter was taken from the door at first by a praying end and afterward sold for a gun. Now, Judith cries, Fenimore Cooper's hero, Deerslayer, Hawkeye. We'll see if kill deer isn't kill eagle too. When I love a thing, I want it and I try to get it. Abstraction of the particular from the universal is the entrance into evil. Love, a binding force, is both envy and emulation. He, the Puritan God, is a realm of mystery and will always remain unknowable, authoritarian, unpredictable. Between revealed will and secret will, love has been torn in two. A poet's words, like the sun against glass, may recoil false meaning back on herself, artificial definition that smears true light with antic reflection. The end of a poem, like the end of a life, releases language into the sovereignty of abdication. Soft as the massacres of sons by evening sabers slain. Poetry is the great stimulation of life. Poetry leads past possession of self to transfiguration beyond gender. Poetry is redemption from pessimism. Poetry is affirmation in negation. Ammunition in the yellow eye of a gun that an allegorical pilgrim will shoot straight into the quiet of night's frame. Child Roland at the moment of sinking down with the sun, like Phaeton in a ball of flame, sees his visionary precursor peers ringed round him, waiting. To Edward Ned Dickinson, mid-May, 1880. Phoebus, I'll take the reins. Phaeton. Okay. Now, what time? So shall I move straight into reading from um, Yes. Yes, yes, perhaps, uh, perhaps you should go straight. Um, um, everyone is listening and your voice comes across very well. Okay. And uh, they followed most of the text. Uh, and it will be much easier now during the poems to follow the text. Yeah. So go ahead. Okay. Um. Wait, get, get, let's, give a, uh, let's give a minute for the technician to set up the text, the, oh, the poems. Maybe um, we're going over time, right? I mean, should I cut away what I... Uh, okay, the, the poems are ready now. And if you prefer to read a uh, few poems, uh, you stop when you, when you need to stop. Well, no, you stop me. That's the thing. Okay, I can. I can stop you. But you do. Well, no, I, I will. <laughs> We're someone. Okay. okay, Susan. So let's uh, let's do this. Uh, 
read the first three poems so that we can have a little time for discussion. Is that okay? Yes, but um, when you say three. <laughs> oh, yes, I know. I know. Okay. I, I okay. Um, okay. So, um, this is from Pearl Harbor. Buffalo. 12. I had, there's another slide, but right. But okay. Yes, there's another, there's a slide right next to you. I won't read it. <laughs> you, you will not read it. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm cutting out, you know what I mean? Now, Buffalo, 12, 7, 41. Is that beside me now? Uh, okay, look. Uh, what we what we're going to do, Susan, if if you want to read uh, less uh, less poems, less text, what we need to do is to follow the same order that we right. agree. No, I'm doing it. Uh, this should be the order. This okay. Be the order. Yes. Uh, it it says Buffalo, twelve seven forty one, late afternoon light, going to meet him in snow. It isn't? No. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, give me just one one minute and I will. I have to pull up the text so that I can see it because I'm look, I'm following it in my cell phone and that's too small for it me. It should be it and should. I have it. I didn't. Yes, because we're following the same. Okay. The, okay. The same. Uh, the same order of the of the book. Okay, so it goes Buffalo. I cut out the first little poem. Then right now, I mean the first lines. Then right now, Buffalo twelve seven forty one. Okay. Yes. Late yes. afternoon light. This was the day of Pearl Harbor. Uh, late afternoon light going to meet him in snow. He comes through the hall door. The research of scholars, lawyers, investigators, judges demands. She, with her arm around his neck, whispers, Herod had all the little children murdered. It is dark, the floor is ice. They stand on the edge of a hole, singing. In Rama, Rachel weeping for her children refuses to be comforted because they are not. Are her cry silences whole vocabularies of names for things. And talkative says we are all in hell. Ghost enters, waves, he scatters flowers from the summit of a cliff that beckons on or beetles o'er his base. Arsons, wicked gate, wicked gate. Magpies clatter, one, two, three. And talkative walks all this time by himself, saying he says to me softly, what? Buffalo roam in herds up the broad streets, connected by boulevards and fences. Their eyes are ancient and a thousand years too old. Here, murder throng their muting. Old as time, in the center of a room, doubt is spun and measured. Throned wrath, I know your word. A chain of parks encircles the city. Snow coming and beauty of long shadows tumbling down, down on every oak, pine, juniper, beech, birch, and other sweet wood, holly. My bones are buffalo and shake their manes like chaff before earth, lasting to everlasting, for floods have lifted up their waves. Heaven and evening are running on the sand together. 
invisible and peace come spilling softly like snow. February seems stable, clarity of frozen. Chance failed as ever, February ends. We'll go north through woods to the wood. Who to call? What name? Abstractions of the world's abstraction warm my icy feet. Forever and for ever winds away. Look back, innermost, broods infinity, boundless. Dithyrams into axioms, accurate as air, reflect, refraction, water, reflection. Transcendent could be buried, or as snow fallen, could be cold snow falling. Lie down in snow, do nothing wrong, but wrong. A sea beast, sunning alone, in still shared secrets of the sea. I think that's probably a good place to stop. Yes. Right? Yes, it's, it's great. Yes, it's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank uh, you for having me, both of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know this is... Uh, is this is difficult when uh, when one is not there in the flesh and meeting people? I know, uh, I know. It's terrible. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, we have uh, we have some questions. Uh, let me see if. Okay. So we have some questions. Um, uh, what we'll do is the following. Um, uh, they sent the vid uh, a video with a question and they sent it in, in, in English. And uh, I, will, I will show you uh, the, um, I will show you the video so that you may answer. While you are looking at the video, Enrique will be will be very kind and translate the the, the I'm, question I'm for the sorry. audience. I don't know Spanish. I feel awful. I'm terribly sorry. No, but don't worry because this question was posed in English. Yeah, I know, but still. So, <laughs> and okay, so this is the question. Let me see. Hi, Hi. Um, um, I'm, I'm interested in how poems find a balance between isolation and porousness, um, both as the poet composing the poem and also the poem itself. Um, if you have any thoughts on how to balance those two things, um, isolation and porousness. Um, isolation and porousness. Well, uh, when I said, when I, um, I think these things happen. Wait, uh, just um, wait a moment. Yes, Enrique, you. So, sorry, just give me a second to translate yeah, the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes. And just wait for it. Were you ready? Uh, her answer should I translate it to? Uh, yes, yes, but go go first with the question and then we deal with the answer. Okay. No worries. Eh, la poeta Nelly Bridge pregunta, eh, dice que está interesada en cómo los poemas encuentran un equilibrio entre el aislamiento 
o el hermetismo, y la porosidad. Y la pregunta es tanto como una poeta componiendo el poema, como en el poema mismo. Entonces la pregunta a Susan Howe es si ella tiene algún pensamiento sobre cómo balancear, equilibrar aislamiento, hermetismo y porosidad. Ok, Susan, go ahead with your, with your answer. Right now I practically forgot the question, but um, the thing is, I think these things are, there's chance and coincidence with language. And um, and I, I do think, like, for instance, when I was reading the Emily Dickinson, here and here, those two H-E-A-R and H-E-R-E, -E, and then ear is also in the, is the conscious ear in that one poem. Um, I think it comes from sort of outer space, but very particular. I mean, what's fascinating to me is the particular and the universal and how it's like how our vision and sound one thing. Um, so uh, it's very, I think translation is very difficult because then um, there was another word, I, uh, what's another place I might and might in English. Might is to be mighty and might is, oh, I might do this or I might do that. Well, these are kind of accidental meetings, but they're very precise. And I can, I, I think they're a gift <laughs> from outer space. And they're also a gift of the ear and the great gift of language. Uh, so I, I, I don't, I mean, I, I think if you're self-conscious about something like that, it becomes artificial. So the great ability is to mix accident and chance and discipline. There we, okay. there we have it, or don't have it. Okay, Enrique, ¿quieres? ¿Sí? ¿Quieres, ¿Quieres traducirlo tú o quieres? O... Voy yo, voy yo y tú complementas si algo me falta. Muy bien. Eh, Susan, Susan eh, considera que la respuesta a esta pregunta, ¿no? El equilibrio entre el hermetismo y la porosidad, ella la piensa desde la posibilidad, la chance, ¿no? De chance y la coincidencia, ¿no? Y le parece que en el lenguaje, en cada idioma, está lleno de pequeños accidentes, como por ejemplo, here de aquí en inglés y here de oír y siente que este tipo de situaciones vienen del espacio exterior, ¿no? tanto en un plano particular como universal. Entonces para ella la combinación y el equilibrio está dado por la visión y el sonido de una cosa al mismo tiempo, para ella visión y sonido van juntos, y por eso le parece que la traducción es tan particularmente difícil, porque piensa en otro ejemplo, might en inglés, que viene también de mighty, alguien poderoso, pero might como alguien que podría hacer algo, que parece casi opuesto. Entonces, por un lado es accidental, pero por otro es muy preciso. Es un regalo del espacio exterior, del oído y del lenguaje. Y a su juicio, cuando uno lo escribe tomando plena conciencia de ello, dentro del poema lo vuelve artificioso. Entonces, más bien la posibilidad de que resulte en una mezcla de accidentes, chances eh, y lenguaje. That was an excellent translation. Thank you very much, <laughs> Enrique. And uh, Susan, uh, there is another question that has just uh, been forwarded to us. Uh, it's, it's written in English, so I will read it for you. Uh, after reading it, I will translate it for the audience and you can, um, and you can begin then your answer. This is by Fabian. And he says that it was a beautiful reading. And he has a question uh, for you. He says that you quote Wallace Stevens in your book, Poetry is a Scholar's Art, adding that it was, your, it was for Emily Dickinson and that scholar signified power. And he wants to know if it also signifies power for you. 
Fabián Iriarte hace una pregunta eh, a, a Susan Howe eh, en, en el libro eh, Poesía es un arte de académicos, eh, donde dice que eh, lo era para Emily Dickinson y que en ese contexto académico o estudioso significa poder y quiere saber si es que ese es el mismo significado o el mismo valor que le asigna Susan Howe. Well, for me, um, yes, I think, uh, I, I, let me tell you why. I love Wallace Stevens' poetry, and I, I, this comes from his adagia, which are, um, you know, just uh, what you, aphorisms, basically. And um, I love aphorisms because an aphorism says something but leaves you hanging a little bit. It doesn't, it doesn't really decide something at the same time it decides everything. And uh, I believe that you can't, I, I, I believe that a poet must read, that reading, 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 you can't read enough. And um, reading is a great joy and you discover uh, paths you're going to take, hints, matches, inspiration. But it, for me, reading is essential. And that is a kind of scholarship. Again, accident and discipline. Both things are necessary, but they're Both things are one. So if you want to explore what that is, what, what I mean by that, which I have no idea what I really mean, you have to keep reading. <laughs> okay, that's... <laughs> okay. Eh, eh, Susan acaba de confesar todo lo que ama a Wallace Stevens y dice que esa cita que usó en su libro y que... Eh, es, es una cita sacada de una colección de aforismos de Wallace Stevens y que ella adora el, a los aforismos porque dicen algo pero a la vez también te dejan colgado dicen sin dictaminarlo todo el poeta eh, no puede dejar de leer dice que no hay lectura que sea demasiada sino que tiene que continuar leyendo siempre es tan necesaria eh, la disciplina como también eh, el azar, y que ella no sabe muy bien qué es lo que quiere decir con eso, pero está segura que aproximándose con más lectura van a poder, eh, van a poder eh, entender lo que quiere decir ella. Ok. <laughs> so, um, well, perhaps, I don't know, do we have time for one? Oh, yes, we do have time for one last question. Let me, let me see. <laughs> okay, this is not actually a question, but this is a commentary, but perhaps you would like to expand on this. Uh, somebody says here that the poet makes silk dresses out of worms. Yes, yes. <laughs> that is Wallace Stevens. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so you are in sync with the audience. Okay. <laughs> So thank you very much. Our hour has just passed and I would like to thank your, your, your patience. Uh, um, this has been a long process, I know. Uh, difficult <laughs> against, okay. against the odds of technology, but poetry, uh, but poetry came through. And that's thanks to you. Thanks no. to your work and to your generosity. Thank you and I thank everybody who's, and the comments. Very good, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Y muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a Susan Howe. Ella eh, tuvo que enfrentar una serie de, de, de obstáculos tecnológicos para estar acá, pero fue perseverante y eh, triunfó con su poesía. Y eso es gracias a ella. Y también quisiera extender el agradecimiento a los dos eh, traductores 
que han permitido que nosotros podamos leer a Susan Howe aquí en Chile, uno de ellos aquí presente, que tuvo la gentileza también de hacer la presentación hoy en día. Muchas gracias, Enrique Winter. Ok, thank you very much, Susan Howe, and thank you very much, Enrique. And, uh, well, well, we'll wait for more books uh, translated into Spanish, signed by Susan Howe. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Ok, hasta luego. <laughs>